Hey everybody, welcome to AP virtual review session number one. I am your host, Mr. Bognot. And we have my co-host, Mr. Billington, or he can be a host and I'll be the co-host. Anyways, uh, hopefully this video finds you well. This video will go over the logistics of taking the AP exam and some things uh, you need to take into consideration when preparing for it. So let's just get right on to it and get started. So let me present my screen, present. And for all you participants, if you do have a question, Mr. Billington will keep track and chat and we'll have time to answer those questions uh, periodically. So please mute your microphone, please uh, share your thoughts and questions in chat and we'll get to them ASAP. So let's get started. First off, I want to do a quick sound check. Everyone can hear me, right? Please just say yes in chat if you can. No echo. Everything's good. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. So welcome again to virtual review session number one. There will be a total of, I believe, five with an awesome late night cram session the day before the actual test, which is uh, May 11th is when you're taking the test, and we'll do the late night cram session May 10th. But um, we're going to host about five. Uh, most of them are going to be at 12th. And uh, it interchanges from Friday, Thursday, Friday, Thursday for those who work on Fridays. So welcome. Let's get started. Uh, the agenda today, we're going to introduce the revised AP exam format. We're going to talk about the FRQ verbiage. We're going to dissect question two. And then we'll have some time for Q&A. So thank you for coming. So our goal is to ensure that you pass the AP US government and politics exam. Uh, again, earning an overall score of three or above guarantees you college credit to most universities nationwide. Again, that is the beauty of AP and uh, when you consider AP versus dual credit because uh, AP is uh, guaranteed to get you college credit nationwide. Attending review sessions will only help you achieve a passing score. And uh, again, your attendance and participation will ultimately help you achieve that. And then Please, 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 if you haven't done so already, take the Valley High School AP Technology Survey at tinyurl.com slash vhsapsurvey2020 because uh, Ms. Salgado, our technician, and Mr. Kelly, the testing coordinator, want to make sure that you have access to technology and internet uh, when you're taking this test. So again, please take that survey. Everybody needs to take it. Here's our review session schedule. Friday, April 17th is today, 12 to 1 p.m. Intro to the revised AP exam format, intro to FRQ verbiage. We're going to talk about question two and Q&A. Uh, next week on Thursday, we'll talk about the argumentative essay. Don't freak out about essay because, hint, hint, it's not really an essay. Friday, May 1st, we're going to take a look at some practice FRQs. You'll actually do them. We'll review unit one key points. Thursday, May 7th, we'll practice question one. We'll review unit two key points. And then Sunday, May 10th, the day, the, the night before the AP exam at 5 to 8 p.m., we'll have a late night cram session. We'll review questions one and two, review units one, two, and three, and answer any questions you may have. So let's start off by taking a look at the revised AP exam format because a lot has changed. A lot has changed. First things first, please check your email and know your login info. Billington and I have used AP Classroom, so hopefully all of you know your AP Classroom login. This is the information you'll use to log into your AP exam on the respective date you're taking it. So May 11th is AP Gov, and then there's another date for AP Lit. There's another date for Environmental Science. The schedule is posted online. So there was an email that went out last Monday, and if you did not get it, you should go to your College Board account and see what email address you gave, as that's the one College Board is using to send out updates and emails. Yeah, and they've been sending out a lot of stuff, so it's a lot of important information too. So, uh, yeah. Things, so make sure you check your email and um, make sure it's accepting emails from the College Board. Students will receive a ticket via email to be automatically admitted to your exam. So on May 11th, you'll receive a ticket. And it's also available by logging onto your College Board account if you still don't receive emails. And if uh, you don't use that ticket, you can also take the exam in June. But here's the thing. I highly, highly encourage all of you to take the exam on May 11th because if there are any issues, you can retake it in June. Whereas if you just skip May's exam and you go straight to June, 
uh, you won't have an opportunity to make it up or um, retake your test. And there's also okay. this weird rumor that AP makes the second test a lot harder than the first one. That they is do true. That regular test as well. That is true because they are not dumb. They realize that people talk about the information on the AP test and um, they'll probably make it a lot tougher and harder for you to pass. So just take the first one on May 11th, Monday, May 11th at 1 p.m. Key ideas, be early. On test day, students should come early to the online testing room, a virtual testing room. So you can fill out a form that will help you prevent cheating. So it's probably a academic dishonesty form. On test day, students will complete a security form and typing sample before they can start the exam. Hence, that's why you show up 15 to 30 minutes early. So technically, you should be showing up ready to go at around 12.30. At the start time, students will be admitted in waves so we don't crash their servers. And a timer will tell them when the test prompt will appear. So it'll probably give you like a one minute alert saying you have one minute to prepare. Your prompt will appear in about a minute. And then once that minute stops, uh, you'll have 25 minutes to read and complete question one, which we'll go into detail later on. How are you going to take it? You have a uh, multiple amount of ways of uh, submitting your test. So you're allowed to either type it or handwrite it. If you choose to type, you'll be encouraged to have two windows open. Window one is the clock. Window two is your response. You can also use a word processor like Microsoft Word, Google Docs, and then upload. Or what you can also do is, let's say you log on uh, via computer, you can have a piece of paper at your desk and you can handwrite your responses. And when the timer is up for question one, you'll have five minutes to upload your response by taking a picture of it or by copying and pasting and posting it onto the College Board website. And you can submit it that way. I highly recommend all of you to actually, and this is just my suggestion, Billington might provide an alternative perspective, but mm -hmm. since testing traditionally is handwritten, it's probably in your best interest if you only have a phone with internet access to handwrite your uh, responses and not type your responses on your phone like a text message. Then again, I'm talking to a new generation of folks where you can type faster on your phone than you can write, but I highly, highly suggest you please just um, either type it on the keyboard with a physical keyboard on your computer or have a piece of paper out and write it uh, and, and handwrite it and just take a picture of it at the end so you can uh, ensure that you're maximizing on your time. Do you want to add to that, Billington? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, the only worry I would have with the writing it by hand is that they've never done that before. So I don't know if they exactly know how that's going to work quite yet. Uh, so I would just be a little bit wary of that. So if you can have access to like an actual laptop with a keyboard during that time and have no interruptions during the hour or two hour long test, depending on how long it takes you, that would be preferable. Uh, but yeah, I would agree. If you're typing it on a phone, I wouldn't do that because for some reason, like things go really weird when you start to type on your phone. So I would just handwrite it at that point. But uh, try to get some type of laptop that like we're checking out laptops, you guys. So they'll, they'll be doing that again if you have, don't have an, a laptop exactly. Uh, but yeah, definitely do that. Don't type it on your phone for sure. Yes, and if you don't have a stable internet connection, you really, really want to go ahead and contact uh, the school, um, either Mr. Scott Kelly or Ms. Anna Salgado, and they may be able to provide you hotspots. You can also turn your phone into a hotspot, but I don't want you to worry about knowing how to do that. If you just know that your internet connection is not stable, you should really inquire about potentially getting a hotspot. But if you are on your phone, if you have like AT&T, Verizon, T-Mobile, it's pretty stable. Um, I don't think you have to worry about that. So again, you have multiple ways of submitting. You can either type it on a word processor on your computer, you can handwrite it, or you can type it on your phone if you really want to. But either way, you are on a time crunch. There is a timer. Each question will have a specific amount of time for you to complete that prompt. And then you'll have five minutes uh, to submit it. So once you've uploaded your first response, the second prompt will automatically load and you can no longer go back to your first response. So if you took a picture and you press submit, or if you just copy and pasted what you responded uh, with the prompt and you just press submit, you can't go back, it's submitted. So make sure you maximize on that five minutes, double check your work and, and take a look at whether or not that's actually going to be your final response because you can't go back. All right, key ideas, no curves. So all of you are at, at an advantage because College Board is not 
going to curve the exam. What I mean by this is typically with the traditional AP exam, they have a certain number of uh, one, certain number of twos. Most people get threes, a certain number of fours, and a certain number of fives. Uh, this year, everyone has the possibility of earning a three, a four, or five, even a one or a two if you just suck. And um, it won't be curved. It won't be curved at all. So that is to your advantage to try your best because, again, Valley is paying for your AP exam. The test is not curved. It's open book. You you literally have no reason to fail the exam unless you just start completely lost and haven't been paying attention to class. Exam scores will be ready by early July and no more than two week delay. So if there is a delay with this new way of facilitating these exams, it'll only be up to two weeks they're saying. And um, that's that, no curve. Uh, key ideas, open book, open book. Students will do their best if they already know the content. So if all of you are going to be like, oh, well, I'm not going to study. I'm just going to go ahead and have all my notes, have all the tabs open, of uh, everything related to government. Uh, again, you're on a time crunch. Every minute matters. So it's in your best interest to go onto Google Classroom, take a look at those review packets, units one, two, and three, and take a look at the key ideas of each unit and make sure you have a general understanding of each point because anything from units one through three is fair game with the FRQs. Oh, uh, also, just to note, the Supreme Court cases are not in this, correct? I'm just double checking. I thought it was that. The Supreme Court cases will not be in this exam. Yes, uh, there is a Supreme Court case, case packet. Um, so it's it's nice to know just the general gist of them, but I'm pretty sure they will not ask you anything about the Supreme Court. Yeah. They will not. Uh, College Board is super serious about catching cheaters. They've already caught someone planning a cheating ring. The consequences, like damaging your reputation with college admission officers, is just not worth it. Measures are in place such that students who try to cheat will find out immediately that they've been caught. So your teachers, us, will receive your responses soon after the exam. So that is news to both Billington and I. Right after you submit it, we have access to your responses. And we actually take a look at them and review them. So if you are like somebody who I would expect not to pass the exam and you have all of a sudden in a uh, five level response, then we'll probably have to mark it as suspicious and we'll have to alert college board. So cheating is not worth it. Alrighty. So you should be taking this test and it's we're, we're in our stay at home, stay home for Nevada uh, initiative, stay at home lockdown. So just stay at home, find a quiet place, take it individually. Don't cheat. Alrighty. And um, you won't have any issues. You want to add anything to that? uh no that's pretty good yeah just don't cheat you know, I, they've got technology that we don't even have so uh i wouldn't do it exactly and um you know just a quick side note valley distributed uh hundreds of laptops to students and there's just been things that have been discovered recently that students weren't supposed to do so if valley can do that i'm pretty sure a multi-million dollar company like College Board will be able to monitor whether or not you're cheating. So please do not cheat, period, as you young kids say. All right. So uh, Billington and I already provided our suggested way of submitting. Again, uh, every person is different. I like to handwrite, even though I love technology, I love to handwrite uh, my responses on a piece of paper. But if you don't like handwriting, you want to type, go ahead and type. Or if you're really adamant about doing it on your phone, do it on your phone. Okay. But that is... Um, our suggestion, not doing it on your phone, like not typing responses on your phone. You can start the exam on your phone to look at the, the, the prompts, but don't type your responses on your phone. So real quick, does anybody have any questions so far? Any questions so far about those key ideas we just went over? There hasn't been any on the chat so far. So, so again, please, uh, whenever you have questions, just go ahead and uh, write it in the chat and we'll get to them as soon as we can. All of you are still with me? Yes? Just a quick test. If you're still here, write your favorite food. Just so that we know that you didn't just put us in the background. Awesome. Cake. What kind of cake? What kind of bacon? You all need to elaborate because elaborating is an important skill for the AP exam. All right. 
So here is uh, the revised AP Gov exam format in uh, just a easy to read uh, slide. Monday, May 11th at 1 p.m. You can't take it at any other time. It's 1 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. If you just so happen to be traveling, just go ahead and convert the time zone to your respective place. Uh, it'll be an online exam taken at home. The exam fee is free. Again, free, 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 free. So it is, it is in your best interest to just start studying, do whatever it takes to pass this exam so that you can save thousands of dollars. Because I'm pretty sure all of you are going to college and all of you are probably thinking, I don't want to stress myself out. I don't want to take the test. But hey, do it. You might save thousands of dollars. You'll save plenty of time. So now you'll be able to take classes you actually want to take and not take political science 101 all over again. Yeah, because it's basically the same class that you're taking. It is the same class. AP exam content, again, it's going to be based on those three units, Foundations of American Democracy, the Branches of Government, and Civil Rights and Civil Liberties. We will go over content-related uh, topics and go in-depth with each of the units at later virtual AP review sessions, so uh, stay tuned for that. But in the meantime, please take a look at those review packets. Exam format and timing, students will be responding to two FRQ questions. Again, you'll have 25 minutes to read and respond to question one and then five minutes to upload. After uploading the response to question one, students will have 15 minutes to respond to question two with five additional minutes to upload their response. So in total, you have 40 minutes of reading the prompt and responding to it and 10 minutes total of uploading your response to College Board. Again, once the response to question one has been submitted, you can't go back and you can take your exam on any internet device that you have access to. All right, let's get into the nitty gritty here. <clears throat> you have two questions that you will be answering. Two questions, FRQ style, free response question style. Question one will be an argument essay, and question two will be concept analysis. Question one is 60% of your score. Question two is 40% of your score. And you will always have an argument essay for question one, and you will always have a concept analysis question for question two. You can't go to question two first and question one. You have to do question one first, argument essay, then question two. And the description of the purpose of each question are as follows. So question one assesses students' ability to do the following. Articulate a defensible claim or thesis that responds to the question and establishes a line of reasoning. In layman's terms, you need to be able to write a thesis to respond to a prompt. Provide evidence from one of the foundational documents listed in the question to support the claim. So you might have a prompt and you'll have to cite one of the foundational documents that you have in your binders currently, hopefully. And if not, we will re-upload those packets on Google Classroom uh, really soon. And if I'm allowed to, I'll, I'll consult with uh, the other AP Gov teachers in the district. If I'm allowed to, I might even post the key to those packets. I'm not sure I'm not making any promises. Let me go ahead and consult them first. So you have to provide evidence from one of the foundational documents listed in the questions. So the foundational documents we have, Federals 10, 51, 70, 78, you have uh, the Constitution, the Articles of Confederation, those packets is what College Board is referring to. And again, it's open note. So if you have access to them, uh, go ahead and lay them out on your table and you can you can take a look at them while you're taking the test to give you a um, a reminder of what that document's about. Provide okay. second ev provide evidence from a second document or from knowledge of course concepts. You can cite what you've learned in class as your second piece of evidence. And then you're going to use reasoning to explain why your evidence supports your thesis. Simple as that. I don't want you thinking that the argument essay is like a Miss Pedrick essay. It's not an English type essay. They call it an essay, but it's really not. Your intro paragraph can be as short as one sentence. And that one sentence is your thesis. If you don't have a thesis, you will fail the exam. You need to have a thesis. A thesis statement is essentially responding to the prompt. And then for your evidence, you're elaborating, right? You have to cite your evidence. You have to cite why that evidence uh, ties hand in hand with your thesis. Valentin, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, yeah, over the summer when we went to the reader, we, we talked to a bunch of people who have graded uh, the AP tests and a lot of them have said with the argumentative essay that if you don't have your thesis statement, like they don't even read the rest of it. Like you just automatically fail. Like, so you make sure that you are saying your thesis statement in, in bold lettering or something because they, they really look for that uh, as far as uh, grading and they make sure that you have some type of thesis. So 
answer the question that it's asking you as early as possible in your answer for this one. And let's see if you're paying attention or let's see if uh, you've learned anything in high school. How long should your thesis statement be? Chat, let's take a look. We got two people. Good, because they call it a thesis statement, not a thesis statement, right? And also, <clears throat> I, I, I make sure that you know what a thesis statement is because fluff will not help you out. Fluff will not help you out. So you, it could be asking you a question and you could like literally list everything you've learned in government, but the readers actually take, the, there's actually human AP Gov teachers that read all of your responses. That's why it takes about a month to give you results. And they all meet in this fancy place in, in where is it? Is it Utah or Florida? Yeah, it depends. Me. But they, they meet all together. They have a fancy lunch and they grade the papers together and they don't have time for fluff. The person who facilitated the training Billington I went to said, we don't look for fluff. We just, you know, we're straight to the rubric and we'll show you that rubric later on. So again, thesis or essay, argument essay, you don't need fluff. You don't need four to five sentences in a paragraph. You just need to answer the question up oh, and look, my emails are popping up. Oh, Hillary Clinton would be so proud. All right, cool. So argument essay, 25 minutes. You might be in shock. You're like, oh, 25 minutes. How can I write an essay in 25 minutes? Don't be in shock. We'll guide you through it. Attend the next uh, upcoming review sessions and we'll give you some tips and tricks along the way. Today, however, we are, since we, since you've just absorbed so much information, we're going to focus in on the easier question which is concept analysis, which you only have 15 minutes to read and write a response for. It's 40% of your score. It's going to be called concept application. Again, question two will always be concept application. And the description of concept analysis is as follows. Question two presents students with an authentic scenario and assesses students' ability to do the following. Explain the effects of a political institution, behavior, or process, and transfer that understanding of course concepts and apply them in a new situation or scenario. In layman's terms, explain the effects of political institution, behavior, or processes. It might ask you to explain something about unit two, the interactions among the branches of government. It may ask you about what the legislative branch can do about a certain situation that you've never been taught before. For example, um, or we'll pause on that. You'll have a couple of practice FRQs where you might be like, wow, we didn't learn this before. And that's the whole point. They're going to have you transfer everything that you should know about AP Gov onto a completely new situation or scenario you've probably never heard about. And the, the cool part about the new scenario is it describes that scenario for you in detail. And when I say like the answers and the question, it truly is. As long as you understand the basics and the foundations of like everything we've talked about in class, um, you should be fine. And we'll go through some examples. Billington, anything? Um, I, I don't think it's going to be as long as like last, if you remember last year's, I think we showed you guys earlier in the year, it was like the, was it the EpiPen one? Is that the one that was Yeah, we're going to show that one today. Yeah, that one is, it's a very long like, paragraph reading. I don't think it's going to be something like that. I think it's going to be something a little bit more simpler, given that you only have 15 minutes to write it all out. Uh, but yeah, they're, they're going to give you some type of scenario or something that you don't know a lot about, but based on your governmental knowledge, you'll know how the government will react to that situation. So, uh, yeah. so my... there, just know about the government institutions, really. Exactly. So it's kind of like with my students with the virtual lessons I talked about, if you've been paying attention. So it's, it's, it's good that you know about federalism. You know it's dope, division of power, right? But can you take that concept and can you apply it to a totally new situation? So they might cite an example of like, Let's pretend it's the year 2050. In the year 2020, and, and there are AP government students taking the AP exam in 2050. In the year 2020, uh, the country faced uh, a pandemic related to uh, coronavirus, yada, yada, yada. Using what you know about federalism, apply your knowledge to how this could be an advantage for the situation or a disadvantage. And um, you just transfer that understanding of federalism onto that specific situation and what certain political institutions can do about it. Or can't do about it. Also, a lot of times there's multiple answers to this question because uh, usually there's a bunch of things that the government can do to react to that situation. So uh, it's it's there's no like exact answer to this one. It's, it's there. So 
the better you do kind of explaining yourself and why that's the correct answer, probably the better for that one. And you all are lucky. You might be bummed out that there aren't any multiple choice questions, but it's actually this revised format is in your favor because like Billington said, it's open-ended. FRQs are open-ended. There is a variety of responses that you can use, variety of examples, variety of pieces of evidence you can use that can be classified as correct. Whereas multiple choice is only one correct answer, right? So this new revised format puts you at an advantage. And with this whole unexpected situation and with the limited time frame you're given, like Billington said, uh, we're going to go over some examples of question two. However, you're probably not going to get questions of length of that are very lengthy because the time for question one and question two, so 25 minutes for question one, 15 minutes for question two, that includes you reading the prompt. The timer starts as soon as you start reading the prompt. So I feel, and I predict, and Billington does too, that you're not going to get a lengthy response or a lengthy prompt, I should say, a lengthy prompt. All right. So question one and question two, 25 minutes to take question one and then five minutes to upload. So if it only takes you one minute to upload your response and you have a four minute break and then the timer will end and it will continue to question two, which is concept analysis. You have 15 minutes to take it, to read and take, uh, to read and response to, to the uh, prompt. And then you have five minutes to upload it and then you're done. Simple as that. And if you're taking any other AP courses, the format will be very, very similar. And again, my emails are popping up. I don't know why. Okay. So you might be thinking to yourselves, what the heck? Only 40 minutes. Yes, only 40 minutes. And to give you a quick anecdote here, I follow this Facebook group that has every single AP Gov teacher or mostly every single AP Gov teacher in the country. And when College Board said that they're going to be giving students two questions for the AP Gov test, everyone was outraged. I was even outraged. I was so mad, like I started to sleep. How about you, Billington? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's kind of like a completely different than what they normally do. So uh, if anything, it probably probably tried to make it as easy as possible. Uh, but I'm a multiple choice fan, so that's just my opinion. Yeah. And again, with the traditional exam, you would typically have like two hours to respond to four questions and you only have 40 minutes. And so again, like we were talking about before with this revised exam that we weren't expecting, they're not going to give you a difficult prompt. So again, if you're fearing about the length of time to respond to these questions, don't. Because if you attend these review sessions, and I know you're doing absolutely nothing, you should be at school during this time, right? Unless you've picked up extra shifts, which I understand. But attend the review sessions. They're only about an hour, right? We're almost done. And you'll get some tips and tricks that you can use along the way so that you can effectively take the test without stressing. So I don't want any of you to stress. Let's take a poll here real quick. How many of you are stressed? You can either say yes or no. How many of you participating is stressed about AP Guff? Yes or no. You're yes, you're stressed. No, you're not. Okay. And us, your teachers lobbied for you to be able to not worry about your fee. So again, you have your teachers to thank for that because we didn't want to start these review sessions uh, when we did not have a clear answer about AP exam fees. So again, it's just free for everybody. And there's literally no, oh, look, Google. Hey, we have 30 people. And I just got a notification. A lot of people are here. Uh, but I just want to stress for you, or I want to reiterate the point that literally you can pass this test, especially this year. I thought last year was like the year where like a lot of people could pass the test. You can pass this test as long as you take the time. And it's tough because you don't have teachers to pester you about it on a on a daily basis. If you take the time to study and think of it long term, like you can save thousands of bucks and you can take classes that you actually want to take when you're in high school or when you're in college. Billy, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, yeah, I mean, they last year we thought we didn't really know what to expect. Uh, and to be honest, we kind of thought they softballed the essay questions last year. So uh, I'm, I'm assuming this year is going to be another kind of softball where you guys can just like knock it out the park very easily. So I have full confidence in you guys to uh, do your best and, and get those passing grades to knock out uh, a couple of thousands of dollars of education for you. Yeah. 
Okay, so let's go over the format of each question, the general format, and then we'll dissect question two. So question number one, which is your argumentative essay, argument essay. Here's a general format. A scenario is given. It's going to tell you to develop an argument about that scenario. And then you're going to use at least one piece of evidence from one of the following foundational documents. So based on that, based on that scenario, you'll have about three documents to choose from to cite evidence from. And then you have to, again, if you remember, you have to uh, elaborate on why that evidence ties in with your thesis. Okay, Bogdan. so that's the format. Bogdan, do you remember what three they gave last year? I think it was Constitution. Uh, they gave an amendment for one of them. It was a Johnson Amendment. Yeah, it was uh, yeah. the interest group that wasn't able to contribute to a uh, person's political campaign. And uh, the students think, yeah. were asked to uh, write an argument whether or not that's an infringement of their First Amendment rights. So yeah. they talked about this amendment. We never went over in class, but it required you to have that background knowledge of your amendments, your First Amendment rights, so freedom of speech, freedom of religion, and you need to develop an argument about that. That's actually the example we'll use next week, and we'll talk yeah. more about that. But again, we can't reiterate this enough. And Miss Pedrick and I were texting yesterday, and I said that if you fail this argument essay, she will be pissed at you. So please, I'm um, being recorded. It's okay. We're like 50 minutes into the video. I don't think, I think we're safe. But she'll be very upset if you don't pass because you did not write a thesis, because that's the number one way to earn zero points. Zero points if you don't have a thesis statement at the beginning. So write a thesis that responds to the prompt and establishes a clear line of reasoning. Support your claim with at least two pieces of evidence. One piece of evidence has to be within the documents listed, and the other piece of evidence can be anything you learn in class or another document. Then you have to elaborate on why your evidence, evidence supports the thesis. Simple as that. Simple as that. And... Uh, the other piece of coming from the, so again, no fluff, like you can write literally everything you've learned about AP gov, but if it doesn't cite one of those documents that are listed, you won't get the point for it. So make sure you have a general understanding of those foundational documents. Take a look at those, uh, packets that we gave you. Um, for my classes, I remember having you just writing a general idea at the front page so that you can quickly just have a reminder of what that document's about. So I think that'll help. Um, I think that's a good way of, uh, reminding you what each document's about by just writing a summary at the front of each of those packets. So I'll upload them on Google Classroom in the event that you have your binders in your lockers. But um, anything you want to add before I continue, Billy's? Uh, yeah, just looking at the, the overall setup, and this is like basically the rubric, essentially, uh, which we'll probably go over later. Um, but I'm looking at it, and I see at very minimum should be about seven sentences. That, that, that's probably what I'm looking at. Uh, yeah, I, I would say at most probably around like 10 or 11, maybe 12. Uh, so it's not it's not like a full, full essay. It's, it's maybe two paragraph long essay. So uh, again, this should hopefully make it a little bit easier for that uh, 40 minute uh, time period for you. Yeah, because he um, because most people freak out about when they see the word essay. They think, oh, man, I have to write a lot. But you really don't in this situation. Um, this, argumentative, this argumentative essay doesn't identify as a traditional essay. It's, it's setting its own standards and rules. So don't freak out about this essay. It's literally, like Billy said, seven, seven sentences minimum, and you should be fine. And that's typically like your average paragraph. So yeah, so 25 minutes should be plenty. If you cut the fluff, don't put fluff. So a good response to question one should... Here's the rubric. You have up to seven points that you can earn by following this rubric. So you get one point just for having a thesis statement, okay? If you just write a thesis statement and you write nothing else, you get one out of the seven points. So you articulate a defensible claim or thesis that responds to the prompt and establishes a line of reasoning. Thesis statement. Make sure you have a thesis statement. You've done DBQs, I think, these past couple of years in your social studies classes. You know what a thesis statement is. Most of you had AP Lang. You know what a thesis statement is. One sentence. One sentence. You get zero to four points for using two pieces of evidence and relevant evidence to support the claim or thesis. And then you get up to two points to explain and elaborate how those two pieces of evidence support your thesis. So you have to take a stance on an issue with your thesis statement. So it's either going to be yes, I agree with it, or no. At its most basic form, it's going to be yes, 
uh, I do believe yada, 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 or no, I do believe yada, yada, yada. You just have to elaborate. And again, they're open-ended for a reason. And there's not just one correct answer that you can possibly have. As long as you can justify your reasoning, justify and articulate what you're writing about, you should be fine. And that's actually a good everyday life skill to have because you have those people on Facebook who are like, oh, I hate Trump and they can't explain why. So start thinking in this format. Start thinking about how you can sound much more intelligent by citing evidence and explaining how that evidence relates to your argument. So, Billy, is anything to add? Uh, no, nope. yeah. Okay. We'll go more into detail, more in depth with uh, question one <clears throat> next week because I don't want to stress you out with the most difficult uh, question right now. We want to go ahead and just slowly transition our way up to question one by starting with question two first. So again, not your typical essay. In a nutshell, paragraph one, restate the prompt. You don't even have to restate the prompt. But if you do, go ahead and restate the prompt and then write your thesis statement. Paragraph two, cite evidence from a given document. Give reasoning behind how it supports your thesis. So the two pieces of evidence. And then paragraph three, how do those two pieces of evidence uh, relate to your argument or how, they, how do they support your argument? And you're done. Simple. All right, question two, concept application. Concept application, again, as we described, it's taking what you know and what you've learned in class and applying it to a new scenario. So here we go, here's a general format. It comes in three parts. Number one, it gives you the prompt, and then it gives you three parts to take into consideration. Describe a power Blank could use to address the issues outlined in the scenario. B, in the context of the scenario, explain how the use of blank power described in part A can be affected by its interaction with blank. And then C, in the context of the scenario, explain how the interaction between A and B can be affected by another factor. So uh, when we take a look here, B ties hand in hand with A. So once you write something for A, you have to use what you wrote for A in your response for B. After that, you take what you have for, for A and B and answer the question for C. Alrighty, so it'll come in three parts. And uh, just, a, just a tip for you, an everyday tip. When you do answer these questions, don't label A, B, and C. Because let's say, uh, this is just uh, what the insider, um, what the judges uh, gave us during our training, some insider secrets. Um, so let's say, for example, you wrote something now you're supposed to write something in A, but you actually wrote it in C. If you didn't label uh, A, B, and C, then that grader, that judge can be like, oh, uh, what we were asking for in A is actually in the third paragraph, but that's fine because they didn't label it C. Does that make sense? So, Billy, you can elaborate on this if you want. Yeah, um, they basically, don't put A, B, and C on your paper uh, in the parentheses. Uh, it's okay to separate them into A, B, and C paragraphs. But as far as actually labeling them those, I wouldn't do that because then it's just one full, um, basically an essay uh, that they look at the whole thing for the actual answers to the rubric. So instead of just looking at uh, where you marked a paragraph, uh, then they would just look for that for the A section and not look at it for like the B or C section. So just don't put A, B or C on your thing. You can just separate them into paragraphs. Exactly. Perfect. So that's the uh, general format. Let's take a look at uh, a specific example that was used prior to this year. Or actually, I'm sorry. I was getting too ahead of myself. Here's the rubric. Uh, it's one point each. Okay. Um, so if you can describe a political institution behavior process connected with the scenario, that's one point that you've earned. If you can explain how the response in Part A affects or is affected by a political process, government entity or citizen behavior as related to scenario, you get another point for that. If you bring it all together, you get another point for that for the final part. So let's take a look at our, again, I'm getting way too ahead of myself. I'm sorry. So at this point in time, we're going to pause on question two, and we're going to actually take a look at verbiage, right? FRQ verbiage, because it's either going to ask you to explain, identify, compare, or uh, what's the last one? Identify, describe, explain, or compare. Yeah, four. So let's just do a quick quiz. Let's pretend this is your AP exam. And it's asking you to identify what Apple product announced on September 10th, 2018 is this. What is that product? 
like if this was your AP exam, write the sentence that you'd use to answer this question. Anybody want to take a stab at it? Well, I'll tell you right off the bat, that's the iPhone, uh, uh, what is it, 10R, I believe. Yeah. No, no, that's the iPhone uh, 11. I updated the picture. So if you were to write a question for that identify verb, how would you identify the iPhone 11? How would you write it? Okay, so Emily wrote, the Apple product that was announced on September 10th, 2018 was the iPhone 11 Pro, okay? The iPhone 11 was an inside job. Now you're not answering the question, so you wouldn't get the point for that. Somebody else give me an example of what they'd write for an identify. If uh, the FRQ is asking you to identify, how would you respond to that? See, and most of you are on your phone, so if you're typing right now and you're struggling a little bit, uh, it just goes to show that's probably faster by typing on a physical computer, physical keyboard on a computer, or um, doing it handwritten. All right, we need a couple more examples. Are all of you awake? Okay, Mar Martin says, the iPhone 11 Pro Max was the Apple product announced on September 10th, 2018. The Apple product that was announced on the 10th of September was the iPhone XR. Uh, the iPhone, uh, Apple announced 11 Pro Max. Okay, perfect. So when it's asking you to identify, you just need to identify what it's asking you. That's it. You don't have to elaborate on it. So you could as uh, cons you write as concise as you can. You could just essentially just say the product announced on September 10th, 2018 was the iPhone 11 Pro Max. All right, let's try describe. Why don't you describe the new 11, iPhone 11 Pro Max? Describe. Just based on that visual, describe uh, what you see. All right, and Yakir is giving actually good anti-answers, non-answers, because again, you're trying to refrain from uh, giving your personal opinions for describe and actually just stating as much factual information as possible. Shown in the above images is the iPhone 1 Pro Max. Somebody give me a good describe statement. I haven't seen anything yet. There we go, Valeria. The iPhone 11 Pro Max has three outer cameras. The iPhone 11 Pro Max features three cameras. It has a phone screen capable of depicting pictures. The Pro Max is the newest version of the iPhone and features three cameras. Okay. Right. You gave a good description, and hopefully you can see the difference between describe and identify. So with identify, you don't have to describe the phone if it's simply asking you to identify what the prompt is about or what the uh, scenario is about. With describe, you have to give a little bit more of a description of what it's asking you to do. Oops. Explain. So explain the new features of the iPhone 11 Pro Max. So if you were to... For example, um, explain what this phone can do. You want to go a little more into depth of what it can do. So you can say like the iPhone 11 Pro Max can take uh, much more wide angle photos and videos. Or you can say the iPhone 11 Pro Max can film up to 60 frames per second in video mode. So you're explaining features of the iPhone 11 Pro Max. And then the fun one is compare, compare the new iPhone 11 Pro Max to the Samsung Galaxy S10 Plus. And essentially, this is what you're doing in your argumentative essay, right? You're taking, uh, you're you're comparing two things, and you're trying to come up with an argument of which phone's possibly better. So hopefully, you see the difference between those four uh, verbs, because you'll always, most of the time, see identify, describe, explain, compare. Nothing else. Billy's anything. Uh, yeah, they're not all four going to be up there, obviously, because uh, there's only A, B, and C. 
Uh, I don't think they've ever done a D portion of a concept yeah. application. Uh, so you'll see that these verbs at the very beginning of each of those. Uh, so you'll kind of know what you have to do uh, for that particular uh, answer to be correct. So let's give you a more realistic uh, example of what you might see on the AP exam. So if it, if it gives you a scenario that talks about Federalist 10, Federalist 10, and Federalist 10 was about how to deal with factions, and it gives you a, a scenario based on what the document was about. And then one of the questions says, identify the document that was mentioned in the scenario. All I have to do is say, the document that was mentioned in the scenario is Federalist 10. That's it. You don't have to elaborate on it. That's why identify is probably the most easiest uh, verbs you can possibly encounter. So don't overcomplicate things when you see identify. Now, when you get to describe and explain, you know, that's when you'll start having to go more into detail. And then compare is probably more argumentative. You'll see that more in the argumentative essay side, question one. And you'll have to be a little more elaborate when it comes to uh, that verb. We're going to skip 2012 me because we're running out of time. But you get the idea. Identify the hairstyle in this photo. A bad one. No, just kidding. Remember, refrain from your own personal opinions. Just try to go off of what you see. So the, the, the hairstyle in this photo is of a shaggy type. There you go. You got the point for that. Describe the hairstyle in the photo. You just say it's long, lush, and beautiful. And then uh, explain why you think that I don't have this hairstyle anymore. And you compare the similarities and differences. So you get the idea. We did this assignment in my class at the beginning of the year and Billington had his version too. So uh, we'll repost that assignment and we will repost uh, this handout as well. So identify, describe, explain, and compare. Again, identify, if it asks you to identify the method used to elect the president of the United States, the POTUS is elected using the electoral college, write a single sentence that correctly answers the prompt. So identify the POTUS, the president of the United States is elected using the electoral college. Simple. You don't have to explain what the electoral college is. You just have to identify it. Now describe the electoral college. You're going to have to write a paragraph identifying uh, the details about it. And then you can see that uh, example there. Explain. You have to prove how or why your conclusion is correct. Explain why you feel the founders in this example chose the electoral college to elect the presidents of the United States. And then compare, write a paragraph that identifies a key difference or similarity. And uh, this was actually um, with argument one or, or question one with the argumentative essay. Traditionally, you'd also have to put a rebuttal and you'd have to compare that rebuttal. You don't have to do a rebuttal since we're on a time crunch. So uh, I'm pretty sure compare will still pop up, but just know your verbs. Know your verbs. Identify is probably the most easiest ones. Don't overwrite because again, every minute counts. All right, let's actually dissect question two at this point, concept analysis. So as you see, this is the format. Okay, that's the rubric. Let's actually take a look at an example of what question two could look like. Okay, so here is a scenario. Billington, you want to read that? Sure, yeah. Um, let me widen my screen now. Uh, consumers complained uh, after EpiPen maker Mylan hiked uh, prices for the emergency uh, auto injector uh, by $100 in a recent, oh, it's not letting me, there we go, hiked, uh, increased 450% since 2004 when a dose costs $100 in today's dollars, it's it, to its current price of more than $600. The medication itself is an expensive uh, analysis calculate that the dose that's contained in a single EpiPen is worth about $1. That is from the Washington Post on August 23rd, 2016. Okay, so remember, concept analysis, it takes what you learned in class and applies it to a new scenario, okay? So here's a scenario. We've never talked about EpiPen before. I don't know who the heck Mylan is. I don't even know what an EpiPen does, or do I? And it talks about how much an EpiPen costs. We never talked about this, but that's the whole point. Can you take what you've learned in government, AP Gov, and apply it to a new scenario? So here's what the question is asking you. Okay, remember that's the format, but now let's take all the information in this prompt and actually have questions for you to answer, and you're actually going to try and answer them uh, in chat. And this is our last thing we're talking about. Okay, so after reading the scenario, which we just did, please respond to A, B, and C below. A, describe a power Congress could use to address the issues comments outlined in the scenario. B, in the context of the scenario, explain how the use of congressional power described in part A 
can be affected by its interaction with the presidency. And then C, in the context of the scenario, explain how the interaction between Congress and the presidency can be affected by linkage institutions. Real quick, I think the most foreign word that's underlined at the moment is linkage institutions. Can somebody in chat tell me what a linkage institution is without Googling? Let's see if you have that general knowledge so you can save time. So let's say you got this question and you're like, I don't know what linkage institutions are. I'm gonna have to search that up. Blah, blah, blah. You just wasted like 30 seconds to a minute. So having that general knowledge will really help. Can somebody tell me what linkage institutions are? I think there's a little bit of a delay. That's why we're not getting instant answers, but, or it's that you just don't know. Let's hope it's the, the former. Somebody just tell me what a linkage institution is. Good. All right. So Alexa, society that connects people to the government. It doesn't necessarily have to be a society. Emily says it links government with the people. A linkage institution, an organization that gives people political knowledge. Perfect. So at its most basic form, uh, Emily got it right. It links the government with the people. So anything that's happening in the world of government, uh, there needs to be some sort of linkage institution to, to give that information out to the everyday people. So how many of you, uh, or how how do you all receive news relating to what's going on with regard to COVID-19 coronavirus? How are you all um, staying up to date? Right. Think of some examples. The media. OK, so the media is a linkage institution. The news is a linkage institution. When you think about it, I am a linkage institution and Mr. Billington is a linkage institution with our posts on social media. That's simply what a linkage institution is. So if you see a foreign word, don't freak out so much because most likely you'll know about it. So, again, there's three parts. So describe a power Congress could use to address the issues and comments outline the scenario. B, it's asking you to describe what you wrote in A and explain how it can be affected by the presidency and then c now you're going to take what you wrote with a and b and explain how it can be affected by linkage institutions so they go off of each other so we're actually going to do this on our own okay let's take a look if you can do it okay so again three points a one point if you could describe a political institution behavior or process in connection with the scenario B, in the context of scenario, explain how the response of part A affects the political process, government, entity, or citizen behavior. And you get a point C, if you explain how the scenario relates to political institution behavior or process. So uh, scoring notes, so things to take into consideration. You get one point for A if the, re the response references uh, the scenario. So if you refer back to the scenario, most likely you get the point. For B, the response needs to demonstrate an action and the impact of that action. If you can do that, you get the point. And for C, to end this point, the response must demonstrate grasps of the appropriate enduring understanding of the appropriate uh, thing that it's asking you to compare A and B with. In this case, it will be linkage institution. So let's go ahead and take a look at the prompt again. Okay. Consumers explained after EpiPen maker Mylan hiked the prices of emergency. Okay. Let's see if you can answer that question. So let's just do one together. Let's do A together by you. Uh, trying to answer this question right now in chat. So describe a power Congress could use to address the issues, comments, outline the scenario. Describe a power Congress could use to address the issues, comments, outline the scenario. Billy's, can you actually type that in chat? Because I'm going to go back to the prompt. So they can refer to back to the B question. B what was that? You want me to type A, B, and C in there? Yeah. OK. Or actually, you know what? I should just do it, because I can copy and paste. Let's yeah, I can, I, was, I can do that. All right. So there's the, uh, there are the questions you're responding to based off of this prompt right here. So Billy's and I will either give you a point or not. But what I want you to do first is answer A, describe a power Congress could use to address the issues, comments, outline the scenario. Okay, we'll give you about two minutes. Realistically, today we went a little bit over time, but I think we'll end by uh, 1.30 at the latest. But I'm hoping to get out of here by 1.20 because I want to be, we want to be respective of your time. But let's judge each other's responses first. So Yakir wrote, the Senate can order a congressional hearing into the actions in question. Okay, what else? 
There's so many answers. Remember, it's open-ended. So again, you're just answering A, describe a power Congress could use to address the issues or comments outlined in the scenario. And the scenario, again, is a new scenario that you've never heard about before, but it's asking you to see if you can apply what you've learned about the legislative branch, about Congress, and see if you can actually apply it to a real-life situation. Give you about one and a half more minutes. Okay, so uh, let's go back to the rubric. Okay, and so to earn the point for A, you need to describe a political institution, behavior, or process in connection with the scenario. Again, the scenario was that prompt. So you get this point if you refer content from the scenario and provide a description. So here is the number one thing you need to take into consideration. For the concept analysis, you do have to cite specifically about something in that prompt. So if many of you just wrote, Congress could, uh, Congress could um, write a bill, that would not get the point. That would not get the point because it says here, the response must refer content from the scenario. So you can also, you can say, instead of Congress could write a bill, which is technically right, you, could, you can say Congress can write a bill dealing with the inflation of prices with the EpiPen, that would be, uh, you would be awarded one point for that answer because you related it directly to that scenario. Billy, is there anything you want to add? Yeah, no, it's, it's not just uh, identifying. Again, it's ex also explaining uh, why you identified that as your like main point. So you can't just write it and then expect the point. You need to kind of elaborate a little bit more on it. Right, because you're essentially describing, as you see in the rubric here. Um, so... Let's take a look at some of these examples and um, we'll ask the chat whether or not this would earn the point. So let's take a look at uh, Alejandro's. Congress can create a law to put a limit on the price for an EpiPen. Short, sweet, to the point. How many of, so if everybody participate, give Alejandra a zero or a one, if you think that's a good answer. Zero if it's a bad answer, one if it's a good answer. Yep, that would be, uh, Alejandro would receive one point for that. It's short, sweet, to the point. And again, that just illustrates the point I made earlier about no fluff. You don't need fluff. Okay, you go straight to the point. Plus, you're on a time crunch. You don't need to put fluff. Uh, let's do one more example. Let's take a look. Oh, I have to take a look at my other computer here. Um, so we can take a look at, let's see. So Yakir wrote, the Senate can order a congressional hearing into the actions in question. So essentially, a congressional hearing is having people directly involved with the situation testify about the situation. So they could contact uh, Mylan, say, you need to testify before Congress to address what's going on. So Yakir wrote, the Senate can order a congressional hearing into the actions in question. One or zero. Alexis says one. Do you give you care of one or a zero? Take a look at what he wrote in chat. The Senate can order a congressional hearing into the questions of that action.
Okay. <clears throat> the one piece of feedback that I'd have is honestly, I think College Board would accept that answer. But again, you need to refer specifically to the prompt. And even though you did by saying, uh, can order a congressional hearing into the actions in question, in question, it's implying uh, that you're writing about the scenario. You need to be detailed about what those actions are specifically. So you could reword that to say the Senate can order a congressional hearing into the actions of Mylan, the um, company that produces the EpiPen. Does that make sense, everyone? Refer back to the question. Okay. So don't fluff your answers, but make sure you are responding directly to the scenario. So again, that just illustrates what I mentioned earlier um, with the question here. Describe a power Congress could use to address the issues, comments. So again, think about what Congress does. What is Congress's purpose, right? They legislate. They write bills to hopefully turn into laws. Okay, so now you know what the function of Congress is. So what could they do in this situation to, um, what could they do in the situation that we're just presented with? Something I've never really thought about. Well, they could probably write a bill to deal with the issues of the inflation of the price in the span of uh, 12 years, right? So again, you just take what you know in government and apply it to that situation. And when I say apply it to the situation, you have to make mention of that situation. So like what Albert said, he didn't specifically refer back to the question. And that's correct. So again, for point A, make sure you refer back to the to the scenario. All right. In the context of the scenario, explain how the use of blank power described in part A can be affected by its interaction with blank. So in this situation, so how, and we'll use Alejandra's example. Congress can create a law to put a limit on the price for an EpiPen. So how can that action be affected by its interaction with the presidency? Okay. I'll give you about one minute to write about that. So how can the action of writing a bill to limit the price of the EpiPen, how can that be affected when the presidency comes into play? one response we'll give you about 30 seconds let's have a couple of responses here now's the time to fail Okay, so let's take a look. B. If the bill becomes a law, the law can be vetoed by the president. Okay, so again, this is where you want to make sure you're um, using your verbiage correctly. So the bill does not become a law unless the president signs it. So the bill does not become a law. But I think what Brianna was uh, thinking about was if the bill passes both in the House and the Senate and it goes to the president, that bill can be vetoed by the president, for which that would earn the point. So you're explaining the um, effect of the presidency with what you described in A. So let's take a look at Alexis's. If the president were to veto the bill for regulating the price of the EpiPen, it would have to go back to Congress to be worked on. And that's actually a good response that would earn one point because it's uh, Alexis is talking about checks and balances, how the president can veto it and it can go back to the, the House and the Senate to be overturned potentially. And so Alexis can add overturned if she really wanted to, but sometimes less is more. Okay, there's less is more. So what Alexis wrote would probably 
uh, grant her the point. Uh, Albert wrote, and our world famous Albert, who really likes to talk a lot. <laughs> I can tell your responses are long too. So make sure uh, um, you keep it straight to the point, but let's see what you wrote. Limiting the price of the EpiPen might affect the current presidency in the sense that maybe based on the president's party, then the president would be perfectly okay with Milan's price hike and EpiPens leading to the president's distaste of Congress's new law. Let's take a look at that. Limiting the price of the EpiPen might affect uh, Mr. Billington, go ahead and give your thoughts on that one. Uh, for which one? For Alberts. Alberts. The president would be um just looking at it uh based on that um make sure you actually have to say what the president will do um basically we're looking at uh saying that he might not like it or he, he might like it but we're looking at maybe what powers does he have uh or possible things he can do to either help it or like hurt it in that sense so, that's a good point yeah, because again, that's why Congress is underlined in A, and that's why the presidency is underlined in B. So the emphasis in B is not what you wrote about in A. You already established that. It's about what the presidency has, uh, what power the president has in response to the power that Congress has. Does that make sense, everybody? Like B is all about the presidency, and then A is all about Congress. So the way I would um, start... Uh, attempting to craft this uh, response would be, okay, Congress, Congress, powers of Congress. What what are some things Congress can do? Okay, okay. Congress can write a bill. Okay. In this situation, they can write a bill about what's the scenario about? Okay. It's about EpiPens. So then craft that sentence and there you go. You have your answer. So now B, okay. How is it affected by the presidency? Okay. What is the president? The president is the leader of the country. Okay. What can he do? So what type of check and balance does the president have with uh, Congress? Okay, so he can veto. All right, let's use veto. So the president can veto the bill that's trying to be passed by Congress. And there we go. Simple as that. You're in the point. Also, just generally think about how those two institutions interact with each other. That's basically all unit two uh, is just the three branches of government interacting with each other. So you can say, well, how does the president interact with Congress? And just Think about a bunch of different scenarios and different things like that. All right, pop quiz, everybody. Which foundational document focuses heavily on checks and balances and separation of powers? Which document? Give me 10 seconds. All right. I am sad I will cry now because Federal 70 is not the answer. It's Federal 51, yo. So remember, Federal's papers, uh, foundational documents, you have 10, 51, 17, 78. 10 is all about factions, what to do with, you know, uh, majority opinion, minority rights. 51 is about checks and balances, separation of powers. 70 is about a strong executive. And 78 is about the judicial branch. So it's actually Federalist 51. And, you know, if we were taking this, uh, if we were um, taking this in uh, the traditional way, you'd probably get that question wrong. But, hey, now you have open notes. So hopefully those are reminders in the front covers of your documents will give you a boost of uh, or a reminder of what that document's about. All right, so now let's take a look at C. In the context of the scenario, explain how the interaction between Congress and the presidency, so everything you wrote in A and B, can be affected by linkage institutions. So again, going off of the same uh, format that we've been following, linkage institutions. First, think about what a linkage institution is. Okay, a linkage institution links the government with the people. All right, what's an example of that? Oh, maybe I can write about, and let's see what answer you have. So we'll give you about one minute, and we'll wrap this all up. In the context of scenario, explain how the interaction between Congress and the presidency can be affected by linkage institutions. 
Again, you don't have to add fluff. You don't have to rewrite everything you wrote in A and B. You just have to answer how A and B is affected by linkage institutions. That was Miss Tasha. All right, anyone? Okay, whatever you wrote, just press center. Let's see what you have. Okay, so let's take a look at those uh, four responses. Brianna writes, interest groups can lobby in Congress to amend certain aspects of the bill. So in the context of the situation, explain how the interaction between Congress and the presidency can be affected by linkage institutions. The linkage institution that Brianna wrote about were interest groups. So interest groups can lobby in Congress to amend certain aspects of the bill. So can interest groups themselves amend the aspects of the bill? Right, they can't. Congress does. So interest groups can lobby to Congress to have them amend certain aspects of the bill. Just try to make it as non as as less vague as you possibly can, if that makes sense. But again, I see where you're going with. Diego writes the interaction between Congress and the president can be affected by the people if the people lobbied and brought to personal attention the hike in price of EpiPen and how it has personally affected the people. So Diego, where is your linkage institution? Is it just the people? Right, because remember, linkage institutions connect the government to the people with the people with the people, and so where's that linkage institution? So you probably wouldn't get a point for that. Kalkidan, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, the media can affect the interaction between Congress and the presidency because it can affect how the public responds. Okay, I like where you're going there, because um, you all did, I believe, in Mr. Millington's class, you all did a public opinion project. So the way the media reports on certain issues can definitely have an influence on how the public responds. So Kalkidan would get that point. Yakir, linkage institutions may negatively portray Congress and cause a shift in party power following midterm elections. Uh, linkage institutions, which linkage institution though, Yakir, you have to cite that you know um, what linkage institutions are. Okay. I'm pretty sure that they'll give you the point for that. But again, we're trying to over prepare you so that you are so you are prepared to take the test that they ask you. So we're actually trying to make it a little more difficult in this session than it actually is when you take the test. So again, make sure you specify. And we'll read one more uh, point. So Albert, again, one of the longest responses, the media could somehow provide coverage of both Congress decision and the president's reaction, meaning that all forms of the Lincoln institution, specifically the news, like they always do, could provide their opinion on the matter. Okay, again, Albert, all right. I know you like to talk a lot, but like, for example, like they always do, that's personal commentary. You don't need that. Uh, meaning all forms of linkage institutions, like the news, could provide their opinion on the matter. Okay, sometimes less is more. Less is more. Not saying that's a bad answer. You'd probably get the point. But again, you're on a time crunch. I just want to make sure you have enough time to answer all parts. And there we have it. That's question two. Billy, do you want to add anything before we wrap it up? No. Well, overall, really good job, guys, for your first go at the first things. Yeah, so again... The key takeaways here are when you see the scenario, okay, underline the key words or since you're since you're reading the prompts from a computer, uh, focus in on the key words like Congress or congressional power or presidency or linkage institutions. Think about what you know about that term first, what you've learned about it 
by way of the foundational documents or what Mr. Billington taught you or what I taught you, and then apply it to the scenario. That is the thought process you should be following. Think about that key term first and then apply it to the scenario. And then you can always, uh, so again, the scenario is about EpiPens. Even though you don't know anything about EpiPens, it's fine. Don't don't uh, be intimidated because everything about EpiPens in the scenario is in the scenario. You just need to have a background knowledge of what Congress is and what they can do, what powers they have, what the presidency is, and what linkage institutions are. And then less is more and you respond to those prompts and uh, you don't write A, B, or C. You just write them separately so you can like skip a line or uh, write it all in one big paragraph and um, you'll get the points for it. So that's question two, content application format. Okay, so here are some examples. Where's the three-point response? Wow, I don't have it. Okay, let me show you an example of a one-point response, okay? Uh, Congress can pass a law setting a price limit of medications on EpiPens, okay? So they got the point for that because they mentioned a power of Congress and then they uh, tied it in with the scenario. And that's what the rubric is asking and it's as simple as that. So that point or that uh, statement got them a point, whereas... This two-point response, an oversight power Congress could use to take action on the complaints above, would be making it illegal to charge that much for medication when the medication itself was extremely cheap, and they keep on going. It's kind of like an Albert response, right? Sometimes less is more. Congress can pass a law setting a price limitation of medication on EpiPens. Done. You got the point for that. All right, two. The president may veto laws if he chooses, okay? He didn't tie it in with A. He didn't tie it in with A. And then linkage institutions can affect it as well. Well, it's kind of like some of those responses that I saw. The IKEA put linkage institutions may negatively portray Congress and cause a shift in party power following midterm elections, right? He didn't specify linkage institution, okay? What if you wrote media can affect it as well? You probably wouldn't get the point for it because you didn't specify what the media is and how it affects A and B. And so that just illustrates sometimes you can have less and still get the point. So um, there we go. Billy, do you have anything? Uh, no, I'm good. Okay. So now's the time before we wrap it up. Uh, q and A. I I know that was a lot. That was so much. That was crazy. That was an hour and 30 minutes of our time. That's crazy. Uh, now I um, invite you to either unmute yourselves and ask questions or write them in chat. So we'll about three minutes to do this, and then we'll end this session. Oh, also, uh, if you have not marked the video as done on Google Classroom, make sure you do that for attendance every every week. I'll have something like that. And like I was telling a couple of my students, right? Uh, just because this session ended up being a lot less intimidating, a lot less stressful, and now you have the confidence of potentially doing well, that doesn't mean just drop everything and wait until May 11th to take the test. It, it, it requires you to take the time to look at those resources, those packets, study up, brush up on a couple of things you may be rusty on, and um, continue to make that progress. So again, I know you, some of you have other AP classes, but we want to make sure that you're getting the most amount of information, tips and tricks as possible to help you pass. Anybody else? Anybody want to unmute? What's with all the robocalls or review sessions? Well, <laughs> it worked, right? Our first AP review chat, there was only like five people. Now there's 30. There, there was go. another one? What? There was another one, yes. Yes, sir. Say that again. Oh, is it rip? I did not understand that. Wasn't it on like April 1st or something? Yeah, it was just more of a checking in on you type of uh, meet. So that has a factor. Oh. As well. Mr. Pogna, no, no. my question is, um, can we get this question on the test? <laughs> you'll have something similar, or you'll probably have something a little easier. I really hope so. Because I feel yeah. like it's easy right Please. now, but then it'll be like 
super intimidating once we actually do it. No, no. I actually feel that you'll, and like what Eric, Mr. Billington said, uh, you'll probably get something a lot easier to read. You won't yeah, get they, prompt so wordy. They softballed it up last year for sure. I don't think college boards that mean where they'll probably give you something <laughs> a lot more difficult than that, especially when you only have 15 minutes to answer, right? They don't want you to take five minutes of that 15 minutes just by reading it. Thank you so much. They did last year. Oh, I have nothing to say about a push. We don't teach a push. A push is totally different. So <laughs> a push is a much more difficult <laughs> test. I will admit that. Well, College Board does care because you still have the opportunity to earn college credit, yo. Especially now, the school is so nice to give you this exam for free. Like, there's no reason not to take it, right? So, okay. So, let's again uh, take a look at the schedule for the next four review sessions. Okay. So, Thursday, April 23rd, same time, 12 to 1. We're going to dissect question 1 FRQ and go through an example, and then we'll have Q&A. We'll probably get done a lot earlier than 1 p.m. since we won't have to go through the new logistics of the AP exam. And then Friday, May 1st, we'll do a practice FRQ like we did earlier, but we'll post it on Google Classroom and you can work on it on a doc. And then we'll also review unit one key points. We'll talk about the foundations of American democracy, the Articles of Confederation, the Constitution, the amendments, all that fun stuff, just so that you can start um, brushing up on that material we learned in September. We'll have a Q&A. And then Thursday, 12 to 1, we'll practice question 1 hour for a Q. So we'll write a practice argumentative essay. And then and my emails are showing up again. Why does my computer do that? That's crazy. I have a hacker. Okay. And then uh, we'll review unit 2 key points. That's all the checks and balances within the branches of government, the functions of each branch of government, et cetera, et cetera. And Q&A. The fun one that I highly suggest you all to attend, the one that we, I should say we, not I, sorry, uh, is um, the late night cram session because that's the night before the actual AP exam. We'll review everything that you need to know to pass this exam. We'll yeah. go over the logistics. We'll make sure you know your college board username and password. We'll make sure you know you're all set up for the following day uh, and um, we'll be good to go. Some other things that I didn't mention in today's session is make sure you start thinking of a quiet place to take your exam. I know all of you have little siblings. Oh, so cute, little siblings, but they're not cute when you're on a time crunch, right? So if they if they storm in your room, Mimi, I'm hungry, then you're, you're, you lost like a good chunk of time. So you got to prepare by telling your parents, your siblings, uh, anyone that might distract you to not distract you. And um, you need to make sure that you can find a nice quiet place where you won't get distracted. All right, Billy's, uh, anything else before we conclude? Uh, nope. Hope uh, you guys are all good and safe and healthy. All right, let's take before you all press end. Don't end yet. Uh, please uh, tell me how you're feeling. Tell us how you're feeling about this AP exam format schedule, anything. Just a one sentence thought on everything going on and whether or not this review session helped. All right, I'm expecting a response from 30 people. Yo, doesn't matter. Diego, how are you feeling about uh, everything we we discussed these past uh, 90 minutes? Okay. Well, these next couple of review sessions will hopefully help you uh, when you take the test on May 11th. So we'll see you all on Thursday, April 23rd, same time. Please share all you know with all the people who aren't here. I will uh, uh, end the recording of this video and upload all one hour and 30 minutes of it on YouTube. And uh, we'll both share it out to you uh, on Google Classroom. All right, everybody stay safe. And everyone leave because I want to debrief with Billington. So leave, go, make like a tree, and get out of here. Anyone know the movie? No? You don't care? Okay. It's Back to the Future. Yes, who said that? Yes. Let's all thank Slayton for oh, getting Slayton? a four-year scholarship. Slayton, now the Chromebooks uh, are you still here.
All right. Slayton, Albert, Tom, Victoria, leave. All right, Captain. Bye, Albert. Sorry I was picking on you, but it's true. <laughs>